I'm really excited to uh, dive into Daniel tonight. We have um, what has been called uh, one of the most prominent uh, Old Testament chapters of text that gives us an eschatological view. What is God doing? Uh, so for those of you that have endured, maybe, the first six chapters and was really hoping for that prophetic uh, piece of Daniel to come out, we're going to dive headlong into it tonight. And I'm really excited uh, to unpack this with you. So uh, let's do what we always do. And let's, uh, we know the presence of, the, of God is here, uh, but let's invite uh, his uh, knowledge and let's invite his help as we study the text. So Father God, we uh, all together confess our desperate need of you. Uh, your word tells us that you are a help to us, that you're a strong tower to us, that you're a place where we can run for safety. And Father, we have said time and time again on Wednesday night in this room that we know that there is a God in heaven. And that God, you God, are in control, that you're sovereign over the world empires. And Father, honestly, when we read some of the texts that we're going to look at tonight, it's terrifying. It's frightening. It causes anxiety. It causes some really big questions to be uh, asked in our minds. Uh, Father, we want to understand it. So that we, we, would, we wouldn't be terrified of what's to come. But Father, we would be in reverential fear of who you are. Knowing that you, God, nothing catches you by surprise. Uh, that you are in heaven and that you are orchestrating the events here on earth. Uh, and Father, you're pushing the corridor of history forward. And Father, you've told us that you're in absolute control. We thank you that you're in control over the nations. We thank you that you're in control over us. And as we open up the word tonight, Father, I pray that you'd give me the ability to speak it clearly, that you'd give me the ability to um, speak what I've studied and, and, and be your mouthpiece tonight. Help me to get out of the way so that you can be right up here, front and center, teaching your church what you have to say. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Daniel, our brother. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, these first several slides uh, we're going to race through, only because we've got a tremendous amount of material to cover tonight. Uh, we're probably going to be, this is going to be one of our longer sessions, uh, just given all the material that we have to look at, I'm giving you a heads up, okay? And so here, uh, as you see, we have switched sections. We're, down, we're now down in chapter 7, verse 1, and we're now in this major theme section that not only is God sovereign over worldly empires, but he is also sovereign over Israel's future. We're going to look at a couple texts tonight where Israel is promised something by God, and it's really, really important for us. Uh, as we've said numerous times, again, this is review, Daniel is not in chronological order. So we moved really, really far in advance in the story of Daniel, and now we're taking a backtrack. And you can see here uh, that chapter 7, the vision of the four beasts, uh, it goes all the way back up there and uh, uh, snuggles in nice and close to chapter 4. Uh, this also shows you, just by way of reminder, what language we're reading when we're in chapter 7. And it also tells us uh, where this particular section fits, okay? So chapter 7, uh, verse 1 through verse 28, uh, that's still in the Aramaic portion of Daniel. Why is that important? What well, you're going to notice, it's extremely important because God is revealing to the ungodly nations how he is sovereign over what's coming. So we're going to look at all of these nations. We're going to unpack uh, what's going to be happening, how God describes them, how he reveals the timelines to us. And so this is still very much uh, in the Aramaic portion. And then this, this is the last time you're going to see this slide. Uh, I just want to draw your attention again to the chiastic structure of chapters 2 through 7. Chapters 2 through 7, notice we begin at the top there with the Gentile kingdoms. We go all the way down to the bottom. We looked at the statue in chapter 2. We go all the way down to the bottom in chapter 7, the four beasts. So there's going to be tremendous similarity between chapter 2 and chapter 7 as we look at the coming kingdoms uh, in Daniel's uh, uh, view, okay? So this is super important here as well. Now, our next slide that we're going to look at is we're going to start diving into uh, chapter 7. As I made mention just a moment ago, uh, chapter 7 is extremely important in the study of eschatology, extremely important in the study of prophecy. A prophecy expert 
Uh, John Walvoord said this, the vision of Daniel provides the most comprehensive and detailed prophecy of future events to be found anywhere in the Old Testament. The most detailed and comprehensive. That's why this chapter is so significant. And so as we go on from there, let's go ahead and dive into the text and look at verse 1 with me, okay? And we'll read down to verse 3. Verse chapter 7. In the first year of Belshazzar, remember him, writing on the wall guy? We've gone back uh, into his reign. As I said, we've taken steps backwards. In the first year of Belshazzar's uh, reign, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum uh, of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea, different one from another. So these verses set the context of Daniel's vision. The highlights here, if you're going to put a time stamp on when this happened, it's approximately 553 B.C., it's a flashback 14 years previous to where we were last year with Daniel in the lion's den. This is previous to the Medo-Persian Empire, previous to the Medo-Persian takeover and defeat of Daniel, or uh, of Babylon, rather. Here, Daniel is approximately 67 to 68 years old. So remember Daniel in the lion's den, he's 85 to 86. So he's a young pup here, okay? And so he has a dream. Now, we've seen this dream thing before, right? Who has had dreams before? Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, right? And who was the one that showed up to interpret the dreams? Daniel shows up to interpret the dreams. Markedly different in this particular story is that Daniel is not going to interpret the dream. So the dream interpreter now needs desperate help to understand what God is speaking to him. And so there's a contrast here, okay? Now you see here uh, this, this phrase, the four winds of heaven, or the four great winds. Uh, this is an um, idiom phrase, okay? It's a phrase that means something else. It stands for something. It's a replacement phrase. And this phrase basically means God's providential actions among men. How is God moving history forward to accomplish his purposes? And so God is stirring up the four great winds. couple examples. Write these down. Jeremiah 23 and verse 9 says, Behold, the storm of the Lord. Wrath has gone forth, a whirling tempest. It will burst upon the head of the wicked. Jeremiah 49 verse 36 it says, and I will bring upon Elam the four winds from the four quarters of heaven. We also see this in the New Testament, by the way. Revelation 7, verses 1 through 3. And I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth. So again, this is idiomatic. It helps us to understand that God has providential control over the affairs of what's going on on our planet. It's not just over the nations, it's not just over the rulers, but it's even over the weather systems. Now, the other phrase that you see here is the sea, okay? Let's look at this back in verse 2. It says, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, okay? Here's this, again, this is another idiomatic phrase that means the nations. Think of this phrase that we oftentimes use in our language, the sea of people, okay? That, that idiomatic phrase, the sea of people, which means there's a ton of people here, okay? You go to Disney World, there's a sea of people, right? That idiomatic phrase actually finds some origin here in Daniel, right? So the sea represents the nations. Now, yes, it also has a physicality attached to it. So what, what we're going to see is around the sea, which would be the Mediterranean Sea, is where most of these kingdoms are going to be located. So it's almost a double entendre here to speak of the nations, the people groups, as well as the location. Now, if we can sum all of that up and make it super simple, 
Here's what I believe the first several verses are telling us. That God, his providential actions among men, among the Gentile nations, they have a purpose. They have a purpose. There's a purpose in God orchestrating the events, the historical events, the coming events in Daniel's timeline. Okay, And so now there's going to be these four beasts that are described to us, that are revealed to us in some detail. Now, I'm not going to look at this a whole lot. I've given you as much information as I possibly can on this slide. As I made mention just a moment ago in the chiastic structure, I want you to see how chapter 2 fits with chapter 7. But I also want you to see how chapter 2 and 7 fit with Revelation 13. Okay? What we see in Revelation 13 is exactly the same thing we see in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. This is why when we were studying Revelation together, uh, we said, wouldn't it be a good idea for us to study Daniel? It's because of this chapter right here. There's a tremendous link between the two. So let's look at the first beast. Okay. Now, by the way, I have some artist renditions up here. Uh, this is not like, thus saith the Lord and and somebody painted these and told us what they were going to look like. This is all conjecture, okay? But I thought they looked pretty good, so I thought I'd throw them up, the, up, up, up on the screen for you. So look at verse 4. Here's the first beast. It says, the first was like a lion, and it had eagle's wings. Then I looked, and its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And the mind of a man was given to it. Prophecy scholar Ron Rhodes says this, this imagery apparently represents the kingdom of Babylon. It's lion-like quality, indicating power and strength. It's also interesting to note here the wings of the eagle, the strength in the eagle's wings, but also the swiftness of it. Uh, very interestingly, I've showed you some pictures of uh, what some of Nebuchadnezzar's palaces would have looked like, uh, but in some of the uh, main entrances, the main gates to the city of Babylon, there were massive winged lions that Nebuchadnezzar decorated his homes with. And so we see that. We also see in scripture the connection points of the lion and Babylon. For example, Jeremiah 4 and verse 7 says, a lion has gone up from its thicket, a destroyer of nations has set out. He has gone out from his place to make your land a waste, your cities will be ruins without inhabitant. That's speaking of Babylon, Jeremiah 4, 7. Also Jeremiah 4 and verse 13. It says, Behold, he comes up like clouds, his chariots like the whirlwind, his horses are swifter than eagles. Woe to us, for we are ruined. We, saw the, we see the same imagery used in other prophetic spaces uh, that refer here to the nation of Babylon. Also in extra-biblical literature, Nebuchadnezzar was often referred to as a lion of a leader. He was a lion. And so, again, this, this imagery uh, connects very well. The wings are meant to represent mobility and swiftness. Now, being plucked off and being made to stand like a man, do you see any imagery there that may connect with us to previous stories of Nebuchadnezzar? I personally connect this with Daniel chapter 4 when Nebuchadnezzar goes insane. But when he regains his sanity, it says that he returned to being a man. So yes, I think the winged lion represents uh, the nation of Babylon, but I think very specifically it refers to King Nebuchadnezzar in the Daniel 4 episode. So God is looking down, or rather he's revealing the, uh, down the line of this prophetic corridor, and the first nation we see is Babylon. The second one is the bear. Let's look at verse 5 in the text. And behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear. It was raised up on one side, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And it was told, arise and devour much flesh. So a lot of imagery here. But this particular beast represents the Medo-Persian Empire, the unified empire of the Medes and the Persians. Now, there's uh, the imagery of it being raised up on one side. It seems to have 
some kind of skeletal deformity where one shoulder is much higher than the other. And in this deformity or in this raised side, it's meant to represent that one part of the kingdom is much stronger, much grander, much larger. And so in that grandness, if we look now to the Medo-Persian Empire, we understand that while, yes, it was a unified kingdom, the Persian side of the kingdom was tremendously more powerful. And so it was the stronger side of this unified kingdom kingdom. So that makes sense for us. We also see that it has three ribs in its mouth. When a bear is eating ribs, that's likely because it's torn apart its prey and it has consumed it. Now the three, I believe, is massively significant because as uh, the Medo-Persian Empire was gaining strength, they devoured the flesh of three separate kingdoms. The first of those being the kingdom of Lydia in 546 B.C. The second, the kingdom of Babylon in 539 B.C. And lastly, the kingdom of Egypt in 525 B.C. Those three kingdoms were all amalgamated into one, the the Medo-Persian Empire. Now Isaiah speaks of this empire in Isaiah 13, verses 17 through 18. And he says this, Behold, this is God speaking, I'm stirring up the Medes against them who have no regard for silver and do not delight in gold. Their their bows will slaughter the young men and they will have no mercy on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes will not pity. If you've ever watched a film where there's a really mean bear, a bear knows no limits. Think if you saw the movie perhaps or even... Uh, uh, the trailers of the movie Revenant, right? With Leonardo DiCaprio when he's attacked by the bear. I can only imagine what it it would be like to be attacked by the Medo-Persian bear. Uh, the, The angry mauling of a bear, and that's what this represents here. The next one is verse six, and this is the winged leopard with four heads. Verse 6, look at this. It says, And after this I looked, and behold, another, like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Now the leopard is known uh, in the study of zoology as an animal that is swift, it's cunning, it's agile. With four wings, a leopard would move all the faster, extremely fast. And a leopard has an insatiable appetite for blood. So the winged leopard here is meant to represent the Greek empire that follows the Medo-Persian empire. Now why might we suggest that this would be the Greeks? Number one, the swiftness in which Alexander the Great defeated the world. Really there was no other swifter ruler to conquer the world. But when Alexander met his demise and he died, that premature death, the kingdom of the Greeks was divided into four. There were four primary leaders, hence the four heads. It was the kingdom of Macedonia, Asia Minor, Syria, and then Egypt. And so here, the winged leopard is meant to represent the kingdom of Greece, the Greek kingdoms. Now, I don't want you to miss this, and again, if you underline in your Bible, if you uh, highlight or, or circle any of those things, look at the end, the very end of verse 6. Uh, those words are tremendously important. They're almost an apex uh, in this passage to help us again understand, this is a reminder, that these kingdoms, dominion, were given to them. Now, What it's meant to help us understand is they didn't acquire dominion. They didn't earn dominion. They didn't conquer for dominion. Rather, God, the sovereign one over the nations, is the one who granted dominion for a time to these ungodly pagan nations. The question you might be asking is, why would he do that? Well, the answer to that is quite clear in the text because he's pushing things forward to the time where he will make everything right, where he will fix all things, and where he will set up the forever dominion 
the kingdom of the Son of Man, which we'll get there in just a moment. We move on to the next beast, and this is in verse 7. Let's read that together. It says, And after this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had iron teeth, and it devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. But it was different than all the rest of the beasts that were before it. It had ten horns. Verse 8. And as I considered the horns, and behold, there came up from among them one another horn, a, a little horn, before which three of those first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and mouth speaking great things. This kingdom is the Roman Empire, the kingdom of Rome. Now, it's interesting here when we study verses 7 and verses 8 and really other places in Daniel as well, is we have a combining of two separate time periods. They're forced together. So we see what is yet future to Daniel in the Roman Empire that we know from our studies in history to be, to be ruled by, to be governed by the Caesars, right? But then immediately following that, Daniel is revealing to us, or rather God's vision is revealing to us, the, this other kingdom, one that would come immediately on the, hills of, the heels of, of the Roman Empire. It was the kingdom of the little horn. So we have the historical Roman Empire that we know, and then we have the eschatological Roman Empire that are there all together. Now, Scripture often uses horn language. And horn language we see here, we see in Revelation, we see in other places to refer to the ruler of that coming eschatological kingdom. Listen to what this writer says it says, Rome fell apart because of internal corruption. But the nations of Western Europe and those adjacent to the Mediterranean are still part of what was once the Roman Empire. When the Germans and the Slavs advanced into the Roman territory, their princes intermarried with Roman families. Charlemagne was descended from a Roman house. And at the same time, the German emperor, Otto II, and the Russian grand prince, Vladimir, were intermarrying with the, with the daughters of the East Roman Emperor. The old Roman kingdom has continued, but without dominion. And so this, the study of the Roman Empire really helps us understand what's going to be coming in the eschatological end. And we're going to study that with some detail tonight and then further uh, as we go into chapters, for example, 10, 11, and 12. Now, for those of you that studied Revelation with me, we unpacked this, we studied this, but there are many of you that weren't able to take that study, and so I think it's important for us to look at this concept, and it's called telescoping, okay? And so telescoping in Scripture is where two events, two distant events down the historical or prophetic corridor are slammed together. They're telescoped together, if you will, okay? And so much so that they look like one singular event, not two. So if we were to look and if my fingers were exactly lined up, it would look like I'm holding up one finger, not two fingers. They're telescoped together because of the distance in which someone has to look to see them, right? And so uh, telescoped events uh, do not alter chronologies, uh, for example. What they do is they just place these in the prophetic corridor so that when the prophet is looking down the line, he's seeing one singular event. Now, an example of this is Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. We're not going to go there right now. You can go and you can study that on your own time. But what uh, Isaiah 61 does is it looks at the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus, and it telescopes them together. This is why, by the way, when the Jews were waiting for Messiah, they were convinced that the Messiah was going to come as a conquering king. They could not see the passion of Jesus, the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, because as they looked down the, the prophetic corridor, all they saw was the victorious conquering king. 
And that's what we see in Isaiah 61. Daniel 12 is going to be another example of some telescoping. And we see that here. Another prominent example is verses 7 and verses 8 in Daniel 7. Okay? So uh, this is what it might look like just as you see a prophet looking down the prophetic corridor. Now, of course, the prophet does not have 20-20 vision when he's looking down the corridor. He's only allowed to see what God is allowing him to see. And so he's not looking down seeing all of the events, but rather God is sovereign in the vision, and that's what he's allowed to see. But still, if you were to see mountaintops, ding, 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 you would see one singular mountain. I hope that makes sense. This concept is called telescoping, okay? All right, so we're going to move on from here, and we're going to look at verse 8 again. Verse 8 again, let me read it. It says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before of which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. So from the Roman Empire in verse 7, Daniel turns his attention to the horns on the beast's head. The horns on the beast's head, there are ten of them. And so these horns represent Ten singular nations that are joining together in this revived, resurrected Roman Empire. Now, this has not yet happened at any point in human history where there have been ten Roman Empire nations to amalgamate together and form this ten nation confederacy in order to accomplish this particular prophecy. Now, I mentioned this all the way back in week one, so I highly doubt that you remember that I said it. But our view here at Prestonwood is we take what's called a historical viewpoint, a literal historical hermeneutic, meaning when we read this, we're going to read it at face value. We're not going to try to make it represent something that's already happened in history. We're going to make it say exactly what it says. That's why I make the point. This has not happened in human history. So this is yet future even to you and I. What's being described in verse 8 has not yet happened. Verses 1 through 7, or rather when the prophecy starts in verse 3, 3 through verse 7 has already happened. It is historical to us. Verse 8 is yet future. Isn't that pretty interesting? And so this is where we walk that fine line of what's already happened and what has not yet happened. So as we dive into verse 8, this is a tremendous synopsis of the entire book of Revelation. One verse tells us everything we need to know. How about that? We're going to have several of those verses coming up in our study, particularly in chapter 9, where one verse gives us everything we need to know. So here in verse 8, again, I looked at the horns. There came up from among them. What's the them? It's ten horns. It's a ten-nation confederacy. So among them, so in addition to the ten, a little horn arose. In addition to the ten-nation confederacy, there was another horn that came up from among them and exercised some kind of power to uproot and dispose of three singular horns. So three horns are uprooted and removed. And the little horn then takes the remaining seven and has full control over uh, the ten. Okay, And the little horn, as we will see here just uh, in brief, is the Antichrist himself. The little horn is the Antichrist. When speaking of the Antichrist, both here as well as other places, uh, Scripture tells us that he will have profound diplomatic skills. 
better than any of our politicians that have preceded us. In any treaty, in any agreement, in any rulership, the Antichrist will have profound diplomatic skills. He wins the affection of the world very quickly. He is a political genius. He compels others to fall in line, i.e. the seven other kingdoms, to follow his lead and adopt his policies. It seems to suggest that this ruler, this individual, this Antichrist figure rises from obscurity. He's the little one, the unknown one, not among the ten big dogs, but the little dog that rises. He ascends the rungs of power quite quickly and eventually is given full global power. Now here, Daniel 7 describes the Antichrist. Let's you can hurry and rush to the end of the book. Let's go to Revelation 13 and let's see what John sees when he looks at the Antichrist. He says, And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Notice how all of these things rush together. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. It had the feet like a bear's and the mouth like a lion's. And to it the dragon, Satan, gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seems to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth revealed, excuse me, the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like the beast? And who can fight against it. In other words, so much power, profound power and authority, it's not even worth fighting against the beast. And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them, and authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written in the, uh, before the foundation of the world in the book of the Lamb who was slain. This is the same imagery. Now here, John reveals something I think to be profoundly interesting, and that is, that the beast, the final beast, the Antichrist, the revived Roman Empire, will have pieces of the other empires. It will have semblances of the other kingdoms, i.e. the leopard, the bear, and uh, the lion. We see all of those things fit together. Now here in Revelation 13, the ten nations, the rulers, the Antichrist gains control over them. And the seven heads, as we studied in Revelation, indicate a power and control over the seven ungodly nations of the world. As we look at what's called in Scripture the time of the Gentiles, there were seven primary nations uh, that were prominent during uh, the time of the Gentiles. Now, as we look at how, go back to Daniel 7, and we look at what is said here, we see that it has eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. So the eyes of a man, this is an idiom that helps us to understand that the Antichrist figure will have great intelligence, great shrewdness, great power of observation. The Antichrist will, will attempt to uh, 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 gather together all the dominion of the world because he will be the smartest person he knows. Now, politicians fancy themselves to be pretty shrewd, right? Pretty wise, pretty, pretty canny, the ability to get votes and lead individuals. And we've seen, at least in my lifetime, some very shrewd politicians, but nothing will compare. We've not even tasted what the enemy can do with this particular figure. He will so easily gather the world's attention and sit the top of the heap that the world won't know what hit him. It will go so quick. And why? 
because the enemy is animating the Antichrist. Satan himself standing behind and speaking through this Antichrist figure. Also says that this Antichrist figure will have a mouth that speaks great things. He'll be a communication genius. He'll have oration skills that are majestic and awe-inspiring. When he speaks, everyone will turn their attention. It will be just the right inflection and just the right tone. He'll be able to stand on a dais and speak English as quick as he can speak Hebrew. To speak German as quick as he can speak Chinese. He'll be able to gather the attention of the world. And as he gathers it together, rule the world in Satan's stead. And as he rules, he will rule in a blasphemous way. Uttering all kinds of things against the God of heaven. Condemning those that believe in Jesus Christ. Now, in direct contrast to this, this this Daniel 7, verse 8, anti-God figure, what does Daniel see next? And this, friends, I think is one of the greatest moments in Scripture. It's the Ancient of Days. Let me read for us uh, verses 9 down through verse 12. Daniel says, and as I looked, can you imagine what Daniel is thinking in this moment? Probably sick to his stomach, needing to take an antacid. Like, what kind of thing did I eat? I know I shouldn't have went to Belshazzar's party. (laughs) Verse 9, and as I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair on his head was pure like wool. His throne was a fiery flame, and its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him, and thousands upon thousands served him, and ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. And the court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. Let's pause there. The ancient of days. Now, this piece of artwork here, if you're not familiar with it, is entitled The Ancient of Days. And it's put together, it's actually a wood carving painted uh, and then pressed uh, by uh, William Blake. William Blake was an amazing uh, English poet, uh, but he was also a carver. And so this is copy K. So he did this many, many times. This just happens to be copy K. I absolutely love it. And it's called the Ancient of Days Setting a Compass to the Earth. This is a creation moment. Isn't that cool? I love that. I told you I like art. So throw some of these things up here to to help you. And so what we see, the Ancient of Days, this is a name of God. Now, why does Daniel call God the Ancient of Days? He's the old guy in heaven, essentially what Daniel says, right? Not so much. Really what's being uh, said here is that God is self-revealing his character to Daniel. And so what he's seeing, Daniel's describing it, but let's remember, according to what Peter said, the writers of scripture were picked up and carried along by the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God is helping Daniel understand this, this characteristic, this truth, this name about God. How does God reveal himself to us so that we can come to understand who God is? Uh, one of the first ways, and this is what we call general revelation, that we see God everywhere we look, it's general, is through creation, right? Through creation, things like Romans 1, since the creation of the world, God's in, invisible attributes have been clearly perceived. Or Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. Every time you go out, not so much in Texas, but from where I'm from in Wyoming, you can go out and you can look at the stars. No light pollution. You can look up and you can see the beauty, the majesty of everything that God put into place. And that's meant to image to us the beauty, the grandeur, the the spectacular nature of who God is. God reveals himself to us in creation. God also reveals himself to us in our heart because we're created in the image of God. It's almost as if God puts his fingerprints on our heart muscle 
so that we, we crave and we long to know the Almighty. In fact, one particular uh, philosopher early, early, early on in about the 4th or 5th century said that that in and of itself is the argument that God exists. The fact that all of humanity searches for the divine is in and of itself the singular argument that proves the point that God exists. But how does that happen? Scripture says, Ecclesiastes 3.11, that God places eternity into our hearts. And that eternity we crave to know God Almighty. We'll suppress it. We'll replace it. But we ultimately want to know. A great example of this is Acts 17 where Paul walks into Athens. He says his heart was terribly provoked because he looked around and he saw a city full of idols. But there was one idol that he particularly liked. He walked up to the idol and had an inscription that says, to the unknown God. The Greek translation of that particular uh, a phrase is, to the God we didn't know, or to the unknown God, or to the God just in case we missed you, God. And so Paul says to the philosophers at the Areopagus, let me just explain to you who this God is. In one phrase, he actually uses Greek poetry. He says, God is not actually far from us, but if you would reach out to apprehend him, he would easily to be held. Meaning that God is near in us. That God wants us to know him. Think of God showing up with Adam and Eve in the garden, just to walk with them in the cool of the day to have fellowship with his children. God wants us to know him. God reveals himself in our heart. The best way God reveals himself to us is through the word, that is, Jesus. It says, the word came and dwelt among us. If you have a King James translation, it says the, uh, the word came and tabernacled, tabernacled among us. What's the imagery there, of course, is the tabernacle was the presence of God on earth for the Israelite people before the temple. And so Jesus was the tabernacle of God, the, the revelation of God's majesty. When one of the disciples says, won't you show us the Father? Jesus says, I'm right here among you. Have you not met him? How long do I have to be with you before you realize I'm revealing to you the Father? And of course, the word, the word, that is the scripture word, God reveals himself to us. The sixth way, which is actually a subset of the word, is God's names. God self reveals his character to us in his names. For example, the name Yahweh, God's first and personal name. That's God's first name. Not Howard, be thy name. <laughs> Yahweh, be thy name. Yahweh is God's name, and it means that God is eternal that he's self-existing, that he has no beginning, he has no end, that he is the eternal covenant-keeping God. Elohim, perhaps you've heard that word, Elohim. It means the mighty one, the mighty one who's able to save, the mighty one who's able to create, the mighty one who is all-powerful, all-majestic, Elohim. We also have the word Adonai. Adonai is the word that means that God is sovereign over all of creation, sometimes translated Lord, and sometimes translated Father, that God has that personal nature with us. He's Adonai. Of course, there's other names like Abba, which is the Aramaic word for daddy or father that reveals that personal nature. The name uh, Yeshua HaMashiach, which means Jesus is our Messiah or God is the Savior. These words reveal something about who God is. It's not that God has a multiple personality disorder and doesn't know who he wants to be called. It's because God is trying to tell us who he is and how does he do it? He does it in a name. So what does ancient of days mean? It means that God is eternal. He's the ancient being. He was the one that has no beginning and the one that has no end. He's the ancient of days, the alpha and the omega. That God didn't all of a sudden appear moments before the creation story, but that God has always and forever existed, that God's outside of time. He's not bound up in the ticking of the clock that really plagues me oftentimes on Wednesday nights. Psalm 90 and verse 2 says this, before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you 
our God. Some scholars seem to suggest that the Aramaic rendering of the term ancient of days means that he's the divine judge, meaning he's the only one with the authority of beginning. And since he was before the beginning, and he's the one that created, he's the ancient being that set it all into motion, he's the only one with the right to become the supreme judge. He is the only supreme judge. God is the judge. Pretty cool, right? The ancient of days. Now as we look toward heaven, and we look at this right here, it says, number one, the thrones were placed. And so this throne that the Ancient of Days sits on, it's described to have uh, fiery flames and wheels of burning fire. Now this is meant to represent the glory of God, the burning of God. For example, Revelation 4 and verse 5 says, From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. We also see in Isaiah 6, in the calling of Isaiah, we see that Isaiah describes around the throne of God these beings known as the seraphim. And the seraphim simply translated means the ones on fire. There was these angelic beings that being stationed in the throne room of God were literally lit on fire by the glory of God. Think about this. When Moses ascended the mountain of God to go and meet with God, to receive the law of God, when he descended the mountain, what did the people say? Hide yourself. We can't take it. It's too much for us. Some Christian scientists suggest that our skin is meant to absorb and reflect the glory of God. That one of the reasons why Adam and Eve had no idea that they were naked was because they, they glowed, they shone bright with the glory of God because God came and dwelt with them in the garden. But when sin happened, that's when the pimple showed up. That's when the blemishes showed up. That's when our skin released the glory of God. And Adam realized, I'm naked and it's shameful. This is not what I'm meant to reflect. I'm meant to reflect my creator. I'm his image to bear the glory of God. Now the wheels, this is super interesting. and We have no time to go into this tonight. But you can go to Ezekiel 1. And you can go to Ezekiel 10, verses 2 through 6, to look at Ezekiel's vision of the throne room of God. And I would be sitting if I were you, because it makes you dizzy. As Ezekiel describes what he's seeing with these wheels of fire and the movement of the throne of God, it's almost like God's chair is on casters, and it's moving fast over the times of men, and these burning fire, the glory of God. And so that's what we see there. The other thing that we see is God's clothing. His clothing is as white as snow and his hair is as pure wool. This isn't a meant to represent an old dude in heaven. It's meant to represent holiness and purity. Revelation 1.14, speaking of Jesus, it says the hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. The holiness, the purity of the Godhead. We also see that in God's presence, there's fire. One of the most famous examples of this is when Moses heard the bleeding of one of his sheep and he followed it into a cave and into an open area and here was this bush that appeared to be on fire, but it was never consumed. And out from the fire, the voice of God spoke, you're on holy ground. Moses, come and approach. We also see the pillar of fire. In Ezekiel 13, we see in Psalm 50, verse 3, our God comes, he does not keep silent, for before him is a devouring fire, and around him is a mighty tempest. Psalm 97, 3, fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries all around. And finally, we have the angelic presence. Talked about that just a moment ago with the burning ones. 
uh, those that are around, stationed around the throne of God, the seraphim and the other kinds. In Revelation 5, 11, it says there were myriads of myriads and thousands and thousands of angels that would surround the throne of God. We can't miss, by the way, this is an aside, but an important one. We cannot miss how here Daniel in the 6th century B.C. is describing the throne of God. In just a few years, Ezekiel will describe the throne of God and his images are strikingly similar. And then we go all the way to 90 A.D. in the book of Revelation. And what does John see but similar images? These guys aren't making this up. It's not some conjecture, not some story, not some myth that's told. But as they look and they see it, they see it. And what we see here is God preparing to judge. And who is he going to judge? So we take our eyes from heaven and we put our eyes back on earth. And we look again, look at verse 11 and verse 12. Said, I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. Now think about that for a second. It's a pretty radical statement. Daniel's attention is drawn into the throne room of God. He sees the ancient of days seated down to judge. In just a moment, he'll see the Son of Man appearing in all of his glory. But the blasphemous, haughty, loud, ridiculous, nonsense, prideful, narcissistic blabber of the Antichrist draws Daniel's gaze away from heaven. I don't think we fully comprehend how wicked, how evil, and the radical nature of the blasphemy that the Antichrist will spew all over the earth. Verse 11, I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Blasphemous words. This connects us back up to verse 8, of course, which tells us that this speaker is the Antichrist. We can also see the resulting judgment that takes place. As I said, the Ancient of Days takes his seat. It's behind the bench, the bench of the law, the final judgment to judge the Antichrist and the wicked, unbelieving world. Ron Rhodes says, the fourth beast, referring to the Roman Empire, revived in the end times and led by the Antichrist, would be killed or destroyed, not by another nation. Take note, the other nations were destroyed by other nations. But here, who destroys the final nation? The final nation is destroyed by God himself. Divine judgment. The empire and its wicked leader, the Antichrist, will, divi will be divinely terminated. And the Antichrist will be destroyed at Christ's second coming. Where do we see this moment? Well, in addition to here, we look at Revelation 19 and verse 20. Where it says, and the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. The final death of the beast and the false prophet. This is the place of the devil, the lake of fire, designed specifically, an outfit specifically for the judgment of Satan himself. Now, all of this, I would like for you to reference in your own time, so mark this down in your notes, Daniel 2, verses 35 through 45. Look at the similarities here in that we have the judgment of God, but in Daniel 2, we have the great stone, not hewn with human hands, but divine ones, and see what the great stone does uh, to uh, the toes, the toes of clay mixed with iron. <clears throat> so, 
dominion is removed. Now, what happens to the other nations? Interestingly here, Daniel is helping us to understand uh, why the beast in Revelation 13 has a little bit of leopard, a little bit of bear, and a little bit of lion. Because as those nations are defeated, they gather together into one mega nation. I think it's the enemy directing all of the power and all of the force and all of the authority he can possibly muster to undo the kingdom of uh, Christ and his saints. Uh, but here, there's a faint existence. Even today, there's a faint existence of the Medo-Persian Empire. It's called Iran. There's a faint existence of the Babylonian Empire. It's called Iraq. There's a faint existence of the once great Greek nations, Syria, Egypt, Greece. There's a faint existence of the Roman Empire, historical Roman Empire, and that is Italy, Germany, the United Kingdom, even by extension, the United States. There's these faint existences that still are here, and when the revived nation hits, all of these pieces will amalgamate together. Let's go back to heaven. So this piece of artwork here is by Gustave Dory, and it's called The Triumph of Christianity Over Paganism. If you want a really cool study, I would highly uh, recommend that you study this piece because it is absolutely fascinating. Um, but we don't have time to look into that, and this isn't an art history course, so we're going to go from here. Let's look at verses 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, again, Daniel is thrust into his prophetic vision. He says, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Theologian Wayne Grudem says this, Jesus calls himself, let's not miss that friends, Jesus calls himself the son of man. This is a term that's used 84 times in the four gospels and only by Jesus and only to describe himself. It's not son of man, but the son of man is a term that Jesus uses. Remember how names speak to us and how names help us understand who God is. Here, this is a name self-given to Christ. And it's a name that describes to us both his divinity as well as his humanity. In this term, the son of man, we have what's called the hypostatic union. That is the hypostatic union of the nature of Christ in that he is 100% God and 100% man. It's described in this very simple phrase, the son of man. Now look where he comes. He comes from heaven. This describes in some ways the incarnation of Jesus coming from heaven. We also see that he's described as the son of man, also describing an incarnation moment where Jesus takes on flesh and dwells among us. We also see that dominion is given to him by the hand of the Father. I can think of many instances where this is reinforced in the Gospels, namely Jesus' baptism, where God says from heaven, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. And so this imagery here helps us to understand who is Jesus? Where does he show up? Why does he come? And so just as God is eternal, God the Father, and always existing the Ancient of Days, notice that Jesus is present with the Ancient of Days in the Ancient Moment. That he is, and, and was rather, with God in the beginning, as John describes it in his Gospel. Dominion is given to him. This is very, very important imagery uh, that we see. And so the reference of Jesus to Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14 in the Gospels is unmistakable, 
unmistakable. In fact, Jesus says, Matthew 26, 64, Hereafter you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus is clearly referring to what moment this Daniel 7, 13, and 14 prophecy. And so again, I've drawn attention to this already, but I want to bring your attention to it again. Daniel 7 is a microcosm of all of eschatology. Because not only do we see the Ancient of Days seated to judge the wicked nations, but we see God giving dominion to the Son of Man, handing the kingdom over to the Son of Man. Where the, the little horn is attempting to usurp God's sovereign rulership, God is sovereignly handing the kingdom to his Son. This is Jesus' exaltation, enthronement, glorification, and it is the full completion of the plan of God. Now, there's tremendous amounts of messianic prophecy that I want to put in your hands. I'm going to do this super fast, so I need you to write these things down, okay? These are not in your notes. I need you to write these down. Psalm 2, verses 6 through 9 says this, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. And I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. And you shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like the potter's vessel. What's being talked about in Psalm 2 is here in Daniel 7 playing out. It's the exaltation and enthronement of the Son of Man. Here's another one, Psalm 110. It says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Which, by the way, Jesus uses this passage to clarify to the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees that he is the Messiah and that he is the Son of God. He uses Psalm 110. It says, the Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments from the room of the morning. The dew, will be, uh, the dew of yo- youth will be yours. And the Lord has sworn and he will not change his mind. You f- are forever and always a priest by the order of Melchizedek. You can read on in Psalm 110. But again, what is happening in Psalm 110 and what is prophesied by David is happening in Daniel 7. Now, for clarity, this Daniel 7 moment, the Psalm 2 moment, the Psalm 110 moment, and other prophetic moments where it speaks of Jesus' exaltation and enthronement, this is what we would reference as an already, not yet passage. That's a key prophetic term. Already, Not yet. Now that seems confusing. Let me unpack it for you. Already means already. (laughs) It's already happened. You understand what I mean? To us, where we are in history right now, Jesus has already been exalted, already sits on the spiritual throne of David, has already been enthroned, and already sits at the right hand of God the Father. Already, it's already done. It's also not yet happened. Not yet happens means it hasn't yet happened. (laughs) Now the reason why we draw attention to the not yet happening is Jesus is not in Jerusalem, seated on the throne of David, ruling victoriously and with all authority From Jerusalem. Is he? I haven't seen the news yet today. So it's already happened in in what we we would call a spiritual sense. But it's not yet been completed in a physical sense. From an eschatological viewpoint, this is already and not yet. Because ultimately and fully bringing to completion, it will happen at Christ's second coming. This is also why, let me give you another example of an already not yet, because this is a confusing, I don't mean to trivialize it, it is confusing. 
Your salvation is already not yet. You understand what I mean? Are you saved? If you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you are saved. That's a past uh, a tense verb. Saved, E-D on the end in English means it's happened in the past. It's already done. But you still have a sin problem. And since you still have a sin problem, your salvation hasn't happened yet. See what I'm saying? There's three tenses of salvation. There's the already, I'm saved, I'm justified, it happened in the past. There's the right now, let's add one more flavor to this. There's the right now, it's called sanctification, where each and every day I'm, I'm, I'm submitting more to Jesus and I'm becoming more holy and I look to act in love more like Jesus. That's the right now, but there's also the not yet. And that's the future piece. When I'll be fully released from my sinful tendencies and my sinful flesh. That's called glorification. It's the already right now and not yet. It's the same concept. Soteriologically, that means with our regard to salvation theology, as it is to eschatology, that is our theology of the end. Who knew you were going to learn so many ologies tonight? Oh my goodness, y'all, there's a lot more we could unpack here. The Son of Man, bottom line, receives everlasting dominion. And His kingdom will never, no not ever, be defeated by another pagan kingdom. The eternal dominion of the Son of Man's kingdom is what we're all looking for. Now, Satan will try. So let me play this out really quick. The tribulation happens. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. Jesus returns and Jesus sets up his kingdom. His everlasting dominion. His rulership on earth. Ruling in victory. Ruling in righteousness. Ruling in holiness. From Jerusalem. From the throne of David. Just as was promised here in, in, in Daniel 7, verses 13 through 14, in Psalm 2, in Psalm 110, and a myriad of other places promised to us that Jesus would set up his kingdom as a conqueror, as the ruler, as the prime authority. For a thousand years, he rules in that holiness. But then Satan's released. And what does Satan do? One last chance. He doesn't learn his lesson. He really can't. So he gathers all of the wicked nations of the world. And there will be some, and I know that's confusing because you just said everybody's righteous and now there's unrighteous people. I get it. It's confusing. But Satan will gather all the ungodly nations of the world and make his last stand in what's called Armageddon. The final war. The final battle. And it won't even be, it won't even be a match. Jesus just wipes him out with the word of his mouth. No other kingdom will defeat the kingdom of the Son of Man. Verses 16, excuse me, 15 and 16 says this. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious and the visions of my head alarmed me. Yeah, he needed some antacid. <laughs> he needed a big drink of water. And he needed to go to a dark room to collect his thoughts. Verse 16, I approached one of those who stood there. Now, how cool is this? <gasps> I love this. This, to me, is humorous, okay? So Daniel's here in this moment. He's just seen all of these things flash in his brain. He's think, he thinks he's there all by himself. He's terribly disturbed by what he's seen, which, by the way, uh, uh, mimics what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar... Uh, was overcome. He was disturbed by what he saw in the visions of his head. Daniel's disturbed. And Daniel's like, what in the world am I going to do? I don't, I don't know what's going on. And oh, there's Gabriel there to help. Gabriel's there the whole time. He's probably the one that brought the message in the first place, feeding uh, Daniel what he was dreaming about. And here he shows up to help Daniel unpack what this is. I think that's awesome. And so he said, I'll make known to you the interpretation of these things. Now, as we look at this, verse 17, easiest part. The four great beasts of the four kings shall arise out of the earth. Daniel 
didn't care about that. He did, but he didn't. And why? Because he'd interpreted that dream for Nebuchadnezzar. He already understood what that was. I understand what's coming. God, you've already told me that. But there's something that is disturbing in that. What's coming, I don't fully understand. This other kingdom. Help me understand what this other kingdom is. And so, as we move on from here, there is a promise to Israel. And that's verse 18. And this is why, in my synthetic chart of Daniel, I put chapter 7 in the section of God is sovereign over the people of Israel. Because... This is what Daniel's most concerned about. Daniel wants to understand how does all of this affect the people of God? How does all of this affect the saints of God? Help me understand why any of this is important because all it looks like is terrifying scene after terrifying scene. It's like Movie previews in October in the United States. Terrifying scene after terrifying scene. Can't let our kids watch any TV in the month of October because of all the crazy movies that are released and all of the previews. Y'all know what I mean? All right. That's my soapbox. Okay, so verse 18 says, But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever and ever. That's what Daniel's most concerned about. How does this affect Israel? How does this affect the believers? Now, folks, I have my feet firmly planted on something. And when this says saints, I want to make sure you understand where I'm coming from. This is not us. This is not the saints of the New Testament. These are not believers in Jesus Christ. These are Old Testament or what we would be better to call as Jewish saints, Jewish believers. That's what's being referred to here in the text. Now, why do I say that? Because Daniel has no frame of reference for the church. Believers at this time are not members of the church. The church does not exist until Acts 2 at Pentecost where God initiates the church. And so here, these are referring to the faithful saints, God's holy people. Not intrinsically holy, meaning it's not some characteristic about them, not the blood that flows in their veins. But they're made saints in the same way that you and I are made saints. You're a saint and I'm a saint. They're made saints because of their belief in the Son of Man. That is Jesus, Yeshua, Hamashiach, the one who is promised, the anointed one, the Messiah, the one we know in the New Testament to be Jesus Christ himself, the one that died, was buried, was raised again to newness of life. Paul says that for our sake, but for their sake, these faithful saints, these believers of God, these that like Abraham believed God and it was considered to them, reckoned unto them as righteousness. It was these individuals that because of Christ's death that he, the Father, made him, Jesus, the Messiah, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that we might become and so that they might become the righteousness of God. I'm firmly planted here, friends that these are Jewish saints. I think it would be a massive stretch if looking down the prophetic corridor, Daniel's referring to the church. I'm not going to unpack this slide with you. You can read, and I've given you a lot of scripture, okay? And so a lot of times the question is asked, how is Israel saved? And that is, eschatologically, in the end, how is Israel saved? And so right here, I want you to read this. I want you to study this on your own. But I've given you bullet point by bullet point how Israel comes to faith in their Messiah in the end. Okay? And there's lots and lots of ways that God deploys some extra resources and really some extra army 
some extra soldiers, some extra infantry to ensure that his people get saved in the end. All right, let's move to verse 19. It says, Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all of the rest, exceedingly terrifying with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, and which devoured and broke in broken pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. And about the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn that came up and before which three of them fell and the horn that had eyes and a mouth and spoke great things that seemed greater than its companions. And as I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until, circle that word please, highlight that word please, until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. And so this right here, friends, is a synopsis of everything we just talked about. From the four nations previous, rather from the three nations previous, uh, to this beast here. We see how this beast is exceedingly terrifying. Teeth of iron, claws of bronze, devours. We see the ten horns again, we see the three horns fall. We see the little horn rise up, and we see this little horn taking control. We see him making war against the saints. That is the people of God. That is Israel. During the tribulation period of time, I firmly believe the church will not be present, that the rapture event will take the church to heaven. And with the church in heaven, the saints on earth are those believers, those Jewish believers that realize that they miss the Messiah, and they place their faith, their hope in Yeshua. Hamashiach, Jesus, the Messiah. And they will endure. He who perseveres to the end shall be saved. During that period of time, the tribulation period of time, it has two purposes. Purpose one is for God to pour out his wrath on the nations. Purpose two is for God to purify himself a people, his people, the people Israel. And in that purification, the Antichrist, the beast, one animated by Satan and empowered by the evil one will make war on the saints and will, for a time, prevail against them. Now, as we've said already, this is to represent the revived Roman Empire. It's different in every way from the first. It's different in its leadership. It is, it is expressly against Christ and energized by Satan. It is different in its scope. It will engulf the entire world, the text tells us. It also will uh, devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it into pieces. We see in Revelation 6 the military genius of the Antichrist who will come out conquering and to conquer, it says. And who can prevail against it? Revelation 13, 4. Now, to summarize all of this and give you bullet points again, I'm not going to walk through this slide, but here we see the bullet points of how is the revived Roman Empire come into being. I'm giving you a lot of homework this week, okay? And so I provided this here to you to help you understand making that connection between what's being said in Revelation and what's being said here in uh, Daniel. I've also given you this slide, uh, which is a summary of many of the characteristics that the scripture gives us regarding the Antichrist, okay? The Antichristos, uh, one who is opposed to or against, in place of or instead of, one who is the counterfeit, the parody, the mock, the pseudo, or the imitation. And so who is this individual and where does he show up? I love this quote by A.W. Pink. He says, across the varied scenes depicted by prophecy, there falls a shadow of a figure at once commanding and ominous. Under many different names, like the aliases of a criminal, his character and movements are set before us. We see the shadow of the Antichrist uh, here in the text. Moving on from here, I want to draw a comparison between the coming anti-king and the God in heaven. And we're almost through. The coming anti-king, the antichrist figure, the ruler of the world at the end, says that he will oppose God's authority by speaking against the Most High. 
He will oppress the saints. He will introduce a new government by changing the times and the laws. He will initiate, he will initially seduce Israel, but turn away from them and break his covenant. This happens at the year three and a half of the tribulation period. It says he will occupy Jerusalem as his capital. And why? Because he doesn't want Jesus to set his feet on the Temple Mount. He will have power for three and a half years, which what Daniel describes as time, times, and half a time, which is described elsewhere in prophetic scripture as 1260 days or 42 months. Look at verse 23. Thus he said, as for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the other kingdoms, and it shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it into pieces. As for the horns, out of this kingdom ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. And he shall be different from the former ones, and he shall put down three kings. He shall speak words against the Most High, and he shall wear out the saints of the Most High. And he shall think to change the times and the law. And this shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. But look at the comparison, verse 26. It says, but the court shall sit in judgment. Who's the court? The singular judge. The only one with authority. The ancient of days. The court shall sit in judgment in his dominion. That is the dominion of the anti-king. Shall be taken away. To be consumed and destroyed to the end. Another translation there is for all eternity. That the enemy of God will be destroyed for all eternity. As God glories in the destruction of of the enemy. Verse 27. And the king and the dominion, excuse me, and the kingdom and the dominion, and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Amen? Look at this slide here as we contrast. There is a God in heaven. And he's sovereign over Israel's future. There's a God in heaven and he's bound to judge the Antichrist. He'll remove the dominion of the Antichrist as it says in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 8. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. God's going to send Christ to destroy the ungodly armies of the nations. Revelation 19. He's going to cast the beast, the antichrist, and the false prophet in the lake of fire. We studied that just a second ago. And he's going to command Satan to be bound for a thousand years. And then God's going to set up the kingdom of his son. That Daniel 7 verses 13 through 14 moment. Of the Son of Man be given all dominion, all authority, all rulership, the exaltation and enthronement of Jesus, where God's covenant promises are going to be fulfilled to Israel. The covenant promises of the Abrahamic covenant, the Palestinian covenant, the land covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the blessings therein, and the new covenant that's coming. The Davidic ruler will take his throne and rule for eternity. As we close up tonight, I want to leave you with one word. And it's the word assurance. Assurance. The word assurance means tremendous confidence. And as believers in Jesus Christ, as New Testament saints, those who enjoy the blessings of the new covenant where the Holy Spirit is, he indwells us. He baptizes us with his presence. And we enjoy the promises of God that are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. We have tremendous assurance that God is in control. Amen. This type of assurance, friends, leads to freedom. Freedom. Freedom from anxiety, free from fear, freedom from the frenetic or a confused faith. Instead, we know that God's in control. 
not only do we know that God's in control, but we have an assurance in God's character. An assurance in his promises. We have an assurance that God one day is going to banish all evil. No more sin. Some of you know that I coach a PSO soccer team, my daughter's team, which is really bad for those girls because I know nothing about soccer. <laughs> nothing. I keep telling the parents, I'm going to age out of this. Meaning, I don't know anything now, so I don't know why you want me to, to coach your girls as it is. But this past week, uh, every, every uh, season, by the way, in PSO, we share the gospel with our kiddos. Uh, that is, every kid on every team in every sport, uh, we share the gospel with those kids. It's awesome. And my team happened to have a bye on gospel day. And so they asked us to follow up and share the gospel. So I'm sharing the gospel with my girls this past weekend. And uh, I asked the girls a question. One of the questions that I asked them was, when Jesus, when we receive Jesus, what happens? And one little girl says, he forgives us. Well, of course. And one little girl says, he gives us eternal life. I'm like, man, this is awesome. We're having a theology class. And one little girl says, I'm his best friend forever. And I love that too. But one little girl says this, one day we get to go to heaven. And in heaven, there's no more sin. No more sin. I was having a little uh, exuberant moment. Just thinking, man, these, these third grade girls, they get it. It's awesome. But I've heard heaven called the land of no more. No more sin, no more pain, no more suffering, no more evil, no more sin, no more enemy. No more nations, just the nation. Assurance. Now here's the other really cool thing, and we can't go home without discussing this. As y'all, Daniel sees all of this happen in 553 B.C. I told you that earlier. It's 14 years before the fall of Babylon. It's 222 years before the fall of the Medo-Persian Empire. It's 407 years before the fall of the Greek Empire to the Roman Empire. And it's 921 years to the breaking apart of the Roman Empire. Today, it's been nearly 2,500 years since Daniel wrote down this prophecy. And here's what I believe. Here's where my assurance lies. Just as Daniel's prophecy accurately, with 100% accuracy, predicted the fall of Babylon and the rise of the Medo-Persian Empire and the fall of them and the rise of the Greeks and the fall of them and the rise of the Romans and the fall of Rome, he will, have predict, he will have predicted the rise, the revived Roman Empire. That just as God did in the past, he will do in the future. God never changes. And as God told us here in Daniel 7, there's so much for us to place an assurance in. That there is a God in heaven. And he knows the times of the seasons. There is a God in heaven who orchestrates the paths of the nations. And there is a God in heaven who is my Savior and my very, very good friend. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this passage. And Father, we have full assurance that you are God and there is no other. And that you are the God that's very much in control of all that we see and all that we don't see. And we're thankful that you sent Jesus to us so that we could have life and have it eternal. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless y'all.